What's going on, guys? Welcome to another edition of the Penn State 365 podcast. I'm your host, Richie Schneider, and I'm joined by uh, Brad Wachtel. Uh, Brad's a bracketologist, well, one of the top bracketologists, actually, in terms of the uh, bracket matrix rankings. Uh, Brad, what's going on, man? Busy time what's for going? You. What's going on, Richie? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'll be honest, beginning of the season, I did not think we would be having a bracketologist on here to talk Penn State hoops, but here we are, and uh, it sounds like they have a pretty good shot, but before we get into all that, I need to, I need you to just do a quick introduction of yourself. I know who you are. I know your background. Tell me about your background in hoops and how you got into bracketology overall. I know it's just a kind of a different profession. Sure, absolutely. Um, so started out, I was always my dad coached college basketball, so I was a ball boy growing up. Uh, he was he coached at Long Island University in Brooklyn, so I grew up on a basketball court basically. <laughs> um, Always loved college basketball ever since I was really young. Um, I ended up being a manager for my high school basketball team, a team manager at, I went to Rutgers University and was a manager there. Um, I then ended up working for a basketball company called The Hoop Group. I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but they run basketball camps and tournaments all over the Northeast. And that's, that's actually where I started doing my bracketology, uh, started posting everything. Um, back in, that would have been back in 2007. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, so it's, it's been quite some time. And then after that, um, I ended up working at Rutgers University with the men's basketball team um, under uh, two different head coaches. So I worked there for six years as the director of basketball administration during that time period due to a conflict of interest, even though Rutgers was not at the time, not near the NCAA tournament, I was not doing my bracketology. So after working at Rutgers, I started it back up um, back in 2016. And, um, you know, it's the reason why I started doing it is because I love the NCAA tournament. I always wanted to be part of an NCAA tournament team while working at a school. That never happened for me. So that was a major disappointment. But for me, this is the next best thing, trying to mimic what the committee is going to do, looking at what they've done in the past, um, how they go about, you know, seeding teams and, and figuring out who should be in and who should be out. And not just, you know, anybody could put together a bracket, but having reasons why a particular, a, each team is in their particular seed. Um, so I try to take great pride in that. Um, and even though I did go to Rutgers and people might think I have a bias towards them, I am not. I, I, I'm a straight shooter. I tell it like it is, and I'm trying to be as correct as possible when it comes to predicting um, the actual bracket. So you were there during the Eddie Jordan era, you said. That's I was, the late I was, Big Ten, I guess early Big Ten for Rutgers? I was there during Eddie Jordan. I was there during Mike Rice. Okay, gotcha. So um, before we jump into Penn State's resume and jump in their chances, tell me about Big Ten basketball in general, what you see. I know everyone likes to think they're overrated, and to be fair, I mean, they don't do much in March. What What's holding them back there, and what do you think is the biggest thing, or the biggest uh, roadblock, I guess? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, I mean, obviously every year is different, um, but in terms of this year, when you compare the Big Ten to other conferences, I don't think the Big Ten is the best conference in the country. I would say the Big 12 is the mm -hmm. best because they don't have a bottom. Um, even though, you know, Oklahoma and Texas Tech are at the bottom of their conference, um, they're not bad teams. Um, but what the Big Ten has, they have a lot of good teams. You know, maybe you have Purdue as a very good team. I don't think there are a ton of great teams per se, um, but there's a lot of good teams, and that's why they're going to get a lot of teams in the tournament. Um, you know, people like to compare, uh, you know, why is the Big Ten getting this many teams in the league? When the, when the selection committee is looking at resumes, they're not saying, they're not capping how many teams from each conference. They do it by individual team, individual team, and just compare resumes. Um, in terms of recent... You know, not much having, not much success in the NCAA tournament. It's really hard to pinpoint that. And I've talked to a number of people about it. You know, for me, it was always like the Big Ten is such a competitive league. The scouting in that league, you know, I don't have facts on this, but I think it's one of the best in the country. Teams know every team and teams play ridiculously hard. They defend. Um, and I, I, I just think maybe when it gets time to the tournament, some teams are just, they've, they've lost it. They've lost their, you know, their, their fire a little. And also I think it's, maybe not their fire, but I think the style of play too um, changes things. But 
I, I don't think there's a particular reason. And, you know, your guess is as good as mine. And I've talked to players and guys that have been on Big Ten teams, and they're like, yeah, that's not the reason. I, I, I just can't put my finger on it. Yeah, no, it's tough. But uh, I I mean, what? The they, they whole entire conference tournament get, didn't get decided until, like, the final game. Like, I know uh, Northwestern, for example, could have been anywhere from the three seed to, what was it, the nine seed. And it yeah, was like, it's, cr- it's crazy. They, actually, they're the, the two seed. So they could be anywhere seed, from the, yeah. yeah, the two seed to the nine seed based on how that game against Rutgers went. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nuts. But I think the great part about the Big Ten, it's ultra competitive. You know, other than Minnesota, you know, even Nebraska has really taken a step forward this year. And they're, you know, they have a chance to actually be in the NIT this year. Uh, so Jeez. I think that's, I think that's great for the league. Um but the only problem with it, there's not enough separation where you're having enough teams that are going to be top seeds, you know, in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. So speaking of the NCAA tournament, I mean, Penn State did just about everything they could at this point, it seems like. Five and six in quad one, four and five in quad two, and then 10 and one in quad three and four, 19 and 12 overall in the season. I know you have them in. Do you, do you think regardless of what happens on Thursday versus Illinois, are they in? So I think if they lose, they still can be in. Um, I'm not going to say they will be in. Um, I think if they win, they should be in. They should definitely be in if they Mm -hmm. beat Illinois, because that would be a season sweep um, of Illinois three times. You know, Illinois is, (laughs) Illinois is a, is like in the seven, eight, nine range right now, but beating them three times is significant. Mm -hmm. Uh, Penn state also had that win at Northwestern, a huge win after suffering, you know, what seemed like a uh, an NCAA tournament ending loss to Rutgers, but <laughs> but clearly they bounced back. Um, so whatever the coaches instilled in them, they have an excellent coaching staff over there. Um, worked, um, and and they're they're a dangerous team. Um, and 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 you also you you put that with wins against Maryland and Indiana um, at home. They they have and Iowa. You know they have six wins over the field right now. A strength of record in, in the top forty five of uh of the field um I, I would say the only thing that's probably holding them back slightly their non-conference strength of schedule was close to 300 not a very good record their road neutral record is six and eight but as a whole when you start looking at flaws every team in this in their seed vicinity at the moment has flaws so honestly what they have going for them is not bad at all I would really like their chances if they can get if they can beat Illinois. That would put them at six and six against quad one opponents, you know. And and, and really, they they would even have a chance to be out of Dayton if they win that game. Wow. So I mean, the other thing I have to everyone always brings up how the the Big Ten or not even the Big Ten conference tournaments in general just don't mean much to the committee. In this case, where the bubble is right there, and for Penn State, for Rutgers, for Wisconsin, does it mean a little more? So it definitely means something. What what I think people are referring to and what the committee has shown in the past, when you get to Saturday and Sunday, those games don't matter. If you're a team that's trying to get into the NCAA tournament and you need to go on a run, they're not changing who's in the field come Saturday. It could have a slight effect on seating. But in terms of the early games, the Wednesday, Thursday, and even Friday games, they matter. They definitely matter. And especially this year with so many Big Ten teams Right on the cut line, you got Wisconsin, Penn State, and Rutgers. You know how those teams do. Some of those teams, even if they win their first game, there's no guarantee that they get in because you have to look at other teams that are off the bubble that might have more opportunities that make a deeper run. Teams like Utah State, teams like Arizona State, Oklahoma State, um, and then that's not to mention there's also the the opportunity for there to be bid stealers in in some of the other leagues. You know, for example, a team like Florida Atlantic at a conference USA, they're in the NCAA tournament. Um, and that's a tough league. There, there's a pretty decent chance that they don't win their conference tournament. And what that does, that takes one, one extra team out of the field and, you know, into the NIT. Yeah. So before we get talking about more about the bubble teams, um, I just want to talk about, give, give me, I'm going to make you think real, real quick. I need one scenario. If Penn state wins versus Illinois, where would they be ranked? And if Penn state loses versus Illinois, how can they get in? I know right now you have them as the last team in the tournament, Dayton bound, but I, I need a, a case for each scenario real quick. Sure, sure. So if Penn State wins, again, there's other variables in play, but mm-hmm. I would say that they that they would be an 11 seed, still would be an 11 seed, 
probably at the top of my 11s in Dayton with the chance to get out of Dayton based on how some other teams do, uh, you know, that are right above them, depending mm -hmm. on if they have a bad loss or not. Now, if they lose, now the thing about, it's interesting because we compare the three Big Ten teams and Penn State, when you look at Wisconsin and Rutgers, Penn State has fewer flaws than both of those teams. So I actually think they probably have the best chance to get in, even if they lose to Illinois. That would be, you know, losing to Illinois is not a bad loss at all. Mm -hmm. um, now, if they lose, they'll need some help. You know, if you're a Penn State fan, you're rooting for Michigan to beat Rutgers because if Michigan beats Rutgers, that's not enough to put them in the field. They would need to win at least another game. They would need to beat Purdue. So I would be rooting for Michigan to beat Rutgers. And I know that's not the easiest thing for Penn State fans to do, but hey, you're trying to get in the field. Um, and then the other one, you're rooting for Ohio State to beat Wisconsin. So, uh, so it's just as simple as rooting for Big Ten teams. There's no one else they have to really root for. So you're 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 rooting, yeah, you're rooting for those Big Ten teams, but you're rooting against a team like Nevada out of the Mountain West Conference. Mm -hmm. um, you're rooting against Arizona State and Utah State. Arizona State has the opportunity to, if they can win two games in the Pac-12 tournament, they play. Oregon State, who they should beat, and then they play USC. A win over USC could catapult them into the field, especially if Penn State loses. And then there's a team like Utah State out of the Mountain West, who's a very interesting team. Their metrics are ridiculously strong, and I have a hard time with them figuring out if they should be in, in now. Um, they have a top 40 strength of record, um, but they have two quad of four losses, which is the one thing that's preventing them from me putting them in. But if they win a couple games, they can leapfrog. And Oklahoma State is the final team. Um, they would need to win a couple games in the Big 12 tournament, which means they would need to beat Texas in the second round, which will be difficult to do, but anything's possible. Um, so there's definitely variables at play. If I'm Penn State, I, I win that game, and you'll feel so much better about yourself. Lose, and it's going to be it's going to be an uneasy feeling coming down to Selection Sunday. Gotcha. So now let's talk about the bubble in general. I know everyone keeps saying it's a weak bubble. It's a weak bubble, but I feel like this is almost like they say it every year. And then all of a sudden there's four five, six bid stealers. And it's like, Oh, look, the bubble's strong again. Is, is that true? And am I, am I correct in that? I think you're correct. I do because teams kind of, there are some teams that, that make a late push and, and, you know, first of all, a team like Charleston, we'll take them. For example, Charleston is currently 28 and three. Um, if they, they play the, their, their conference semifinal game of the CAA tonight, and if they win, they'll have 29 wins going into the finals. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at their resume, they don't have any quad one wins, um, but they have a top 50 strength of record, and they'll have a record of 29 and four should they lose going into Selection Sunday. Now, teams don't get in based on record alone, but that's a team that, that is going to give, give the committee some pause. Hey, we're 29 and four. Um, you know, with a, with a pretty good net, a net of 53, which is actually, you know, right in the range of where Penn State is right now. It's actually better than Penn State at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's a team that is tied for first in the CAA that could pop up and end up becoming in the bubble conversation. Michigan mm -hmm. is a team that, you know, a few weeks ago, they weren't even close to the bubble. But the way that their schedule ended up, it was the bottom of their schedule ended up being with a bunch of teams that are really, really strong, and they've done well. They've done three and four. They've gone three and four of their last seven games. You know, not quite well enough. I thought they needed to win at Indiana or at Illinois to really give them a legitimate shot. Now they're going to have to win a couple games to kind of put them back in the fold. But yeah, I I, I do agree with you. Um, I think it's. I don't think it's the the quantity of teams that are there right now. I think the resumes of the teams that are, you know, the last four teams in and then the first three or four teams out are getting very, very close, closer than they much were over the course of the last weeks. And then, of course, it, things get really interesting if there are the bid stealers. Then all of a sudden you have, instead of having, you know, eight teams for four spots, you know, then you have eight teams for two spots. Um, so it, it definitely gets dicey when, it, when, when that happens. Yeah. No, I, I know you kind of just mentioned them. Even if Penn State wins, they're probably still in Dayton, if not very close. So this probably won't attribute to them that much. But in terms of regions, is there any shot in hell that they get like 
a nice region where they're playing in the Northeast or, or even the Midwest where it's, I guess, Iowa or playing over at Albany, or is it kind of just a crapshoot at that point? It, it is pretty much a crapshoot. Um, it's definitely possible that they end up, but chances are with the four regions and chances are it's probably not going to happen. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, they, they'd love to be in the East and play in Albany, play in Madison Square Garden, be in that course, region. Yeah. You know, any East Coast team would love that. But <laughs> unfortunately, when you're a seed that low, it's that's totally out of your hands. You know, really only if you're a top four seed, um, do you get a preference, basically? Um, and it's not even really a preference. It's the way that works is if you're a, if you're a top four seed, the teams that that's the number one four seed gets preference. So, you know, if UConn was the number one four seed, they would choose to be in the East, but there could be another East team as a four seed and they don't get the East. So it's, even if you are that high, there's no guarantees. Gotcha. And then and when do you, like, I guess when do you start like looking at brackets? Is it just like a year round thing? Like, did you like see Penn State at the beginning of the year? And like, yeah, there's, there's no shot. And then all of a sudden now it's like, oh shit, like, <laughs> hold on. Yeah. So, so Penn State, so I, I typically start like in December. Okay. Um, but but I'm always watching basketball games, always. I follow especially the Big Ten. I mean, that's probably the conference I watch the most. Um, and I know Pitt – I'm sorry. Penn State, <laughs> yeah, well, it's been – it's it's uh, uneasy on the eyes at times for sure. But the, the thing I love about it is that it is so competitive, and there's so many teams that are involved for, for an NCAA tournament bid. Um, but, yeah, Penn State was picked towards the bottom. They were supposed to be in the bottom four. Mm-hmm. Um, of the Big Ten going going into the Big Ten tournament. And when I saw them in their early season tournament, um, I think it was down in South Carolina they played yep. uh, in Charleston. Um, yeah, they, they really impressed me. Um, they're, they're a team that is extremely enjoyable to watch because they can shoot it. Uh, they, can, they can shoot the three. And I think that's something that, you know, a team needs to do to advance in the NCAA tournament. So, I can see them making a run, and they have a veteran team. They have a ton of old guys on, on, on their squad who know it's their last year playing college basketball, and you know, it's now or never. And, and maybe that kicked in um, a week ago. And, uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I thought back in, back in November, December, that this team had a chance to be a tournament team, and they were not. I, I thought if they, if they were picked to finish at the bottom of the Big Ten, and the Big Ten was going to be really good. Turns out the Big Ten is very deep. Um, so they're, you know, but I, but I think they're for sure better than than anybody anticipated. Yeah, no, for sure. Now um, you, you mentioned that they, you think they can make a deep run, kind of mostly because of their shooting. Is that like what? What's the you you studied almost every tournament? I'm sure, at least in recent history. What what is the perfect? I guess um, combination for a team to make that deep run. Is it just good shooting for the most part? Is it just good defense because we've seen Virginia make runs on defense alone. So typically you want to be, you want to have a little bit of both, um, you know, in terms of Ken Palm's efficiency ratings, you would ideally you want to be in the top 25 of offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency, mm-hmm. which is, is difficult to do. Those are the teams that, that can win it all. So maybe we're not talking about Penn state winning at all, but I think you good defensive teams. If you get the right matchups, you can advance. But I think ultimately you have to be able to score the ball Um, and you got to be tough. And I think those are two things that Penn State are. You know, maybe they don't have the best defense per se going for them, but they do have the toughness. And if they get the right matchups, they can score it. And when they're scoring the ball, they they can be unconscious. And I think they have it in them if they get the right matchups to make a run um, should they make it. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, now let, let's talk about the real tournament for a second, the Big Ten tournament. I, I need your prediction here. What what's going to happen here? I'm not asking you to go game by game. If you want to, that's up to you. But just give me a little quick prediction of what you see happening in the Big Ten tournament this year. Yeah, so it's tough because I I like Purdue. I don't love Purdue. Mm-hmm. I'm not sold on them. Um, and I think I think. Michigan is going to beat Rutgers um, just because the way Michigan has been playing of late and they know that they have a good history against Rutgers and I feel like they'll beat Rutgers and then they'll have this game against Purdue. And I think in their minds, and, and it might be true if they win that game, they'll go to the NCAA tournament. So mm-hmm. I, I like Michigan to win a couple of games um, and get to the semifinals. 
Um, so that's one team. <laughs> um, Iowa is a team that has been so inconsistent, but I think they're a team that they're the team that has a a low ceil- a, a low floor but a high ceiling. Um, mm-hmm. I like Iowa as the other team in the semifinal. Um, and then as we get down down the bracket, you know, Penn State's beaten beaten Illinois twice. Can they beat them a third time? Illinois is that team that come the NCAA tournament, they'll end up in the Sweet 16 or they're, they're going to lose in the first round. <laughs> um, but I like Penn State. I do. I think Penn State with so much on the line right now, uh, I think they pull out that game. Um, and then I like Maryland to beat either Nebraska or Minnesota, even though Nebraska has been playing really well. And I'll take Indiana to beat Maryland in that next round. And what's mm-hmm. crazy is Penn State would play Northwestern. I, I mean, if you're Penn State, how could you not, not like that game? Um, I'm going to take Northwestern, though, kind of as a safe play, just based on mm-hmm. the fact that they have the extra day off. Um, so I see, I see the last Final Four of the Big Ten tournament as Michigan, Iowa, Northwestern, and Indiana. And then mm-hmm. my championship game, I'm going to take – Iowa and Indiana, Ooh. and and I'll I'll have Indiana winning it. Oh, after after all that preseason Big Ten, uh, Big Ten selection, and now all of a sudden they're going to win it all. It seems like, uh, I mean, hey, that's a safe bet. I I think I think you're spot on with the Michigan thing. I actually have Michigan winning it all personally. Wow. Okay. Which I I think they're talented. I just think the coaching situation is a different issue. But give Martelli the reins, and hey, who knows? Let's see what happens. <laughs> but. Uh, no, I do. I do think Penn State makes a little bit of a run, though. I, I think they could be very competitive against that Northwestern team in, in round two. It's. I think. Like, I think their their first game against Illinois is going to be a tougher game than their second game. So yeah. can they? The question is, can they beat Illinois for a third time? Um, I mean, for me, like that game and the, that game is the game of of the of the quarter of the I guess whatever the second round for me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the game that I, I can't wait to watch. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun. I think it's uh, 5.30 Central Time. So uh, it's going to be interesting. We'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. But, uh, Brad, that's really all I got for you. Is there anything you want to plug before we sign off here? No, Obviously, nothing else. facts um, and bracks, but. Yeah, you can you can follow me on, on Twitter for those that don't follow me. My my uh, Twitter account is uh, at Brad underscore Wachtel. That's W-A-C-H-T-E-L. Um, I post my bracket. Just as on a landing page, uh, factsandbracks.blogspot.com. Feel free to check it out. All right, guys. That's Brad Wachtel. I'm Rich Schneider. Uh, It's Penn State 365 Podcast signing off.